Over to you. Okay, feel free. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the developer development environment workshop um, for PulpCon. Um, yeah, so uh, the first thing I just want to mention real quickly is that there's maybe a little bit of overlap between this topic and the uh, installer topic and the uh, community and SATA plugins topic. Um, and so I'll try and avoid um, I'll try and avoid overlapping with those too much. Uh, but I want to, to mention it um, if if I start tra straying too far into one of those topics, um, someone just prod me. Uh, yeah, um, so whoops. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Or should I zoom? Should I zoom? Uh, zoom would be nice, yeah. Yeah, it's a little small on uh, the stream there, Daniel. Is that better? It takes about 10 seconds for the stream to catch up to us. Oh, really? OK. Yeah, it's good. <clears throat> All right, um, so first topic, um, what docs does one really need to work on Pulp? Um, and I asked this question. First to Jared, because um, he's, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, Jared was our intern this summer. Um, and since he is probably one of the the freshest, uh, the people with the most fresh experience with this, um, I figured it would be good to ask him. He had some really good answers and feedback on this. Um, his answer was, I think the most important things from new contributors is knowing how to set up an easy dev, dev environment knowing where to make changes, and knowing how to test those changes. Um, does anyone have anything to add to that? Uh, or do you think that's not captured by that? Um, where would that information be presented? So the main place that would be presented, well, that'd be presented in different places. So there's the installation documents. Um, or, or the contributing guide, rather. See, this is actually uh, the whole thing is is we've got we've got this information in multiple different places, kind of spread out. Um, and I think it might be useful to uh, to talk about like have having uh, the entire process from start to finish. So my item here. Um, uh, I want to quickly step through the process of going through the docs, uh, what what the docs currently gives you to set up a development environment. And because I noticed, I noticed some things. Um, so this is the contributing section of our pop core docs. Um, should I zoom this too? You might not be able to see it. I don't think it's yeah. Please let's zoom a little bit. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Um, so this is the contributing section of our pull core docs. Um, and the developer setup section is pretty short. Um, it has a link to pulp lift, um, but not really any more information than that. Um, and of course it tells you to get the source. Um, and it tells you, you know, read the instructions at readme.md. So if you go to the readme.md, uh, you've got a couple of installation instructions here um, at the very top. But if you were to actually be like a developer, um, that wants to you know start developing on a plugin, uh, you need some information from all the way down here at the bottom, um, which is how to edit these config files, config.yaml, to choose which plugins to install. And uh, I think this is maybe a little bit out of order in that respect, the, the readme. Yep. It feels like, it feels like we're like getting... I agree. 
So it, it, it's a quick start. Go ahead. Daniel, we're getting a lot of echo from your side when we speak. Thanks, Daniel. I was just going to say, it feels like, and we've we've heard this in a couple of contexts now, it would be useful to have a uh, quick start where we just say, do these things without any real explanation, and then have the explanation of the individual sections after that. Yep. Yeah, the main thing is, so we've got this documentation bit split across several different places, and you've kind of got to bounce around a little bit to follow it. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, even if we did all, did that, it would still be, we'd have to to like, write a bunch of different quick start instructions per distro, like the quick install, uh, the quick start on a Fedora 32 or 31, Fedora host is different from on a CentOS 7 host, a CentOS 8 host, the Debian host, you know? Yeah, I think for most users, they probably just want to start developing though, and they don't really care about what distro may be. Yes, but you know, they have, they still have, our whole workflow is based on the assumption that they install Poplift. We can recommend which distro they run in Poplift, but how you install Poplift varies from distro to distro. Oh yeah, like, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I understood what you're saying. Yeah, I agree. Uh, they, the SSHFS plugin is not universally available, for example, or via package, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, this kind of goes back to what I heard earlier. I forget by who, but um, pulp is we, we really have an emphasis on flexibility. But what would be helpful is have a recommended default. Right. We can. I'm more than happy to have a recommended default, like you know, pulp lift box, like make it CentOS eight or Fedora thirty two. That's that's the easy part. It's just having quick install, no matter what Linux distro they're running on their host. Well, and the other half of it, as referenced in the, the comments that Jared gave here, are I have it up and running, and there's still things that would be nice to, you know, have in one place on, on regardless of how you set it up, how do I, um, what, what are the, the tips and tricks section, I guess. Um, I know when I started a year ago, the most helpful thing I had my first week was Dennis gave me his startup notes file, text file which was nothing but that. It's just this long brain dump of stuff. And I use it on a regular basis and have it checked into my own, my own pulp startup repo um, precisely for the, those kinds of questions. Yep, mm -hmm. um, I agree with that. Uh, I, I also realized that I have misunderstood your point. Um, I think it's similar to what David Davis had, <laughs> um, Mike. Uh, Mike. Um, and what I want to do is bring some feedback I'd heard from some other folks who work with the Galaxy team, um, Chris Hausnett particularly, which was that uh, he was using a Mac and our developer environment was not easy to use on a Mac because uh, our image type that Vagrant uses is libvert based. And so it would be helpful if our default was VirtualBox based, which isn't really the default in the Fedora ecosystem, however, is actually much more widely available with Vagrant. And since you have to have Vagrant, you're going to get that as a dependency immediately. And that's one thing that we're not doing quite as well in terms of our defaults, I think. Right. I think what's basically happened is, you know, for like 75% of our boxes, it uses libvert or Vagrant. It uses libvert or VirtualBox. It just uses whatever you have. Uh, but for like 25%, like CentOS isn't publishing the boxes, you know, that we have to manually create them. And that's where the, we start doing libvert specific code. Or libvert yep, code. and, and um, just to get, we'll get it right back into Daniel's stuff. I'm sorry to take away from it, Daniel. Um, my observation no is if we're recommending a default, let's pick one of the ones that has ubiquitous box availability. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other alternative is just to have maybe three quick start guides or two quick start guides, one for Mac, one for Linux. I mean, I think that would work well too if you have a page and you just have those links down there. I agree. The operating system we're using. You click it. Right. But, you know, it's just we need it per distro, basically, the quick start of 
installing the the installation of of, of vagrant with libvirt and all is distro specific. Do we have that now somehow? I mean, like, uh, I guess uh, not. Not really. We're 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 very unprescriptive in this area from a copy paste perspective. Um, Daniel, we say you need Vagrant, and then we just point you at the Vagrant docs. I, I, Daniel, can you open? Um, go to the popular feed me. We have the generic requirements, and then we have the quick install on Fedora. Right, like I can't just literally translate that per distro because like the SSHFS plugin is often not dev or RPM to be installed anywhere. You have to do like the whole Ruby dev setup, you know, to sometimes to install Vagrant SSHFS. Yeah, I think like just having the big ones would, might be nice, like Fedora, um, Debian, or Ubuntu. Mac. Yeah, yeah. Like I could do as many quick starts as possible. It's just someone not going to be quick. And it, yeah, I mean, I tr I wouldn't try to just support every OS. Like I don't think that like Windows. I wouldn't even maybe bother with that. But yeah, it's. I could, I could, so so right. I, I always find if you have a installation instruction that definitely works on some Linux distro, there's some responsibility for people using other distros to like look up what the equivalent package names are in their distro. You just can't write instructions for every distro out there or every package manager out there. And yeah. and usually, if you have some Linux experience and you have some experience with your distribution, you can figure out how to like you have. Well, here's how it works on this distribution for Vagrant, and then you can figure out how it works for your distribution if it's ever been going to work on your distribution. Yeah, and so I think that's reasonable. I mean, my biggest complaint here is that there's no step-by-step -step guide here. It's just a lot of information about like how you would go about setting up your development environment spread across several yeah. web pages. That's my big issue. Agreed. And no Mac yeah. instructions is my gap observation. Yeah, I will, like I, I will yeah. say on a, a lot of projects do have, you know, like quick quick install for Fedora, Debian, Ubuntu. Um, usually there's at least like maybe three distros. We don't have to go for like all of them, but right. usually a couple. Right, it's just to be like the simple answer is like it's uh, there's there's SSHFS version requirements, and some some just shows it just won't be quick. It'll be install Ruby dev environment, you know. Yep, and this is my question: uh, Is the choice of SSHFS the best one for usability? So I just want to point out that the documentation was the main thing that I was planning to talk about at the installer section. <laughs> okay. You want to move on is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Move on. <laughs> All right. Um, There's one thing I'd kind of like to throw into the room, uh, also on like documentation. So if I just start out with pulp or want to do something in pulp, do I want to read any like Django documentation or like, I mean, I think in practice, knowing what I know now, I haven't done a lot of that and mm -hmm. I guess I'm okay. <laughs> but like, it's it's a question that might come up for people who start and maybe isn't really answered anywhere. Like, is there other things I need to look into other than just like pulp docs? Well, I think it's OK to state that this project is based on Django and that you can expect the developer to look there for Django specifics. I think the thing to highlight would be where the normal, you know, there's a lot of people that have done 50 Django projects and that knowledge, the stuff in pulp, well, that's not going to apply. It's like using Dynacomps and the way the plugin discovery works, that stuff. You know, might be a little. If you're gonna describe Django-related stuff more specifically, yeah. I think there are a small number of places in our documentation where we do explicitly point people to the Django documentation, and I think the uh, settings .py is one of those um, where, where we actually yep. say, "Yeah, we just use the Django documentation. Go look at that." So I think I'm hearing a couple of things here. 
One is if you're just using pulp, then you, the, the amount that you need to know about Django is relatively small. Settings is a good example because you're affecting the Django instance at that point. If you're developing for pulp, then it's useful as part of the, I want to develop for pulp, which, what do I need to know? A link to, we're based on Django. Here's the tutorial for how Django works and just point them over to an explicit piece of Django doc and say, get started with that because it'll tell you how everything fits together. And then what I hear, heard Adrian say is, I am coming to pulp as a new pulp developer. I've done a bunch of Django and having a section saying for the experienced Django developer, these are the things that we do differently would be useful as well. So it's like three different user stories, user hats, if you will. Yeah. Or just barely some Django experience, but that's still um, the place that's sort of distinct. Dying to cough is the one that comes to mind. Right. Yeah. Okay. So there's another item. So just moving, moving on through. Um, and, and unless does anyone have anything else to add to that topic? No. Okay. Um, so one of the other things that uh, Jared thought it might be useful to document um, is going back to the setup, the startup guide that uh, that Grant was talking about. Um, I also have one of those. I think it's a very common thing um, on the team. And there's a lot of stuff in these startup guides, I'm guessing, that is not in our documentation, like um, adding port tunnels for uh, like PyCharm remote debugging or uh, aliases, like uh, knowing that P bindings exists or, or P start or P stop um, or P status. Um, and those are all really helpful bits of knowledge that aren't necessarily in our documentation. Agreed completely. Yep. Yeah, I believe we have one for PyCharm. Uh, or maybe it was in pulp 2 docs <laughs> uh, But if we have it, definitely not in one place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've also noticed there's no documentation on how to run tests in your local environment. Yep. I think pretty much the only way you'd know to do that is to go look at the CI, the CI scripts. Yeah, yeah. and then Norway. Yep. Yep. That is a that's really good feedback. Um, we definitely need to make that very clear. Yeah. And on the same kind of note, uh, Jared also pointed out, um, if you're making changes to pulp, uh, you need to restart everything. You know, I mean, not necessarily everything, but realistically, if you're making some changes, you should restart everything. Um, I'm not sure if that's documented. I think it, it might be, but... Um, I think it's also documented just using uh, systemd commands, whereas we've got these aliases in our dev environment. Um, yep, the alias. Make it easier. Are, are we not documenting the aliases anywhere? I, I don't think we have documentation for the aliases anywhere. I haven't seen it. I think there's they're not some, recommended. There's some mention if you spin up the pulp lift box, like in the message of the day, once you SSH mm -hmm. into it. I think <laughs> mentions the pay help and then pay help yep. mentions all the other ones. Yep. And Adrian, isn't this something that we had talked about early on? Or uh, maybe I remember you talking about early on? Which part specifically? Uh, the, the unexpected um, and need to know knowledge around restarting tasks when developing tasking code. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've definitely ran into that. I'm not sure if it's documented anywhere, but yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's an easy thing to stumble over, even if you forget and haven't worked on the task in a while. And... Yep. OK, so does anyone know of any other little bits of information like this in the same kind of vein that uh, 
that you'd seen like one of our startup guides, but not in our documentation. One other thing um, is perhaps a little bit more clarity around the way the reverse proxy system works. Um, there, when you're developing, sometimes it's meaningful around your Apache and Nginx configuration versus the raw um, WSGI processes running on 24816 and 24817. And we don't really have that anywhere as far as I remember. As a developer, sometimes you want to make requests that bypass the reverse proxy. Sometimes you don't. That's good. Also, also, um, I find that using uh, being able to access your developer system from your host box is really useful. And we don't talk about that. And I use the Vagrant. I forget what it's called. It's a Vagrant plugin that does this. And then Matthias came host along manager. one day on the mailing list. Host manager. I use Vagrant host manager. And Matthias came along and said this really much better way that seemed way better. And I, I didn't do it because mine was working. But regardless, being able to access the dev environment from your host box is a really great thing. You mean by access the network access, not the file system? Yeah. Yes, that's smart. Yeah, that thing, that, that very helpful thing that you suggested that I did not try yet. A couple other things that have uh, I've ran into this. One is uh, love to be able to get away to kind of get a better idea of where all the different configurations that pulp and or a plugin winds up using, uh, you know, can kind of go in and dump it at very place, various places and there's, you know, diff settings or whatever, but that's all pretty vague. Uh, not exactly sure what the approach would be for that, but I would just definitely been a big stumbling block for me at various times. So it's like, oh, no, you're using the the this this setting from the environment and that setting from a daddy and file and this setting from you know a, a yaml file from somewhere else that I forgot to delete uh, and tracking that stuff down and sorting it out especially if you're not you know destroying the environment and recreating it every time you you run something um, yeah one aspect like you're saying Adrian I agree completely one aspect is Dynaconf list, and maybe you said yes. those words, but we don't yeah, we don't tell anybody about Dynaconf useful. list. It's not useful. Did you say it's not useful? It's, it doesn't tell you the information as Pulp is using it. It tells you as the information as you ran Dynaconf list. That's uh, it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think we I need see. to provide very clear documentation on how to write Dynaconf, uh, to run Dynaconf list mm. uh, as the application is running Dynaconf. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because, that sounds useful. Yeah. I've run into this problem myself, um, for sure. I mean, it's somewhat, I'm going to tell an embarrassing thing on myself. I've been working on Pulp for <laughs> a year now. I didn't know until last week that etsy pulp settings.py existed. Yep. So when I wanted to set temporary settings, I was setting it in the the one that's you know in the GitHub repository and re and then restarting everything. And so I have a ton of stashed in you know git stashed of a mm -hmm. copy of the settings.py with my particular settings in it because I'm dumb. And Boy, did I feel ridiculous last week. And that's after a year of working on Pulp. You're not dumb, Grant. That is the problem. We don't have yeah. it documented. <laughs> I agree. Right. And I, I do the same thing, especially if I'm doing, you know, I do crazy logging setups and yep. know, stuff like that. And I wind up doing a lot of the same kind of thing, especially with some of the Galaxy config that's kind of in the same place and kind of not. Okay, I don't feel so The bad. other thing I would love to know is how to get debuggers on tasks in a way that's I've had no luck doing that. Adrian, is that a is that a 
I mean, for me, I'm just using, I live in um, PyCharm and, mm -hmm. you know, I copy the, the two lines that PyCharm says I've set up into the place I want to set a breakpoint and set PyCharm to, to look for that. Um, and then I run the application and PyCharm handles that connectivity for me. Or is it something yeah, that, that, that? That's fair. I mean, that's, that's actually more of a Galaxy issue than a Pulp issue, to be fair, because we're running it in a different, more containers and just the unicorn and yeah. yeah. It, it, yeah, it is simpler to do. Um, yeah, that's fair. I mean, that would still be useful to have. And if, uh, um, sorry, if you guys, if you figure out a, a, a reliable way to do that, that, feel, that would be like a great blog post, for example. I'm sure it's one of the, you know, 7,000 Ganunicorn or WXDI config CLI options. That'll do it. It's fair. Um, so one more thing I think we don't have documented, and I don't know if it's worth it, uh, but probably will be helpful for Kirin or any other contributor who deals with migration plugin. I think we have no... Um, docs around the box, which has both pop two and pop three installed. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's like totally uh, a mystery if you're not on this team. <laughs> so Tanya, what, what sort of documentation are you thinking of? Like, do you just mean in the readme it should be mentioned in the list? Or, um, well, first of all, I guess it's worth knowing that such box exists where pulp two and pulp three are running together. Um, and then there are some specifics, like there is no nginx, I think, on this box. There is like a special Apache config, um, and things like that. Uh, there are additional p those aliases, um, I think, on mm -hmm. that box. So where do you think we should document this? Would this go in like the um, pulp lift uh, readme docs, or would this go in other docs? I would get developers set up. Um, like if developers want centralized box with those two on them. Okay. I see that on the pulp lift readme, uh, there are listed send box boxes, source boxes, maybe dedicating a paragraph about the uh, pulp two and pulp three installation side by side probably might be a good place to start with. Yeah. It looks like the box itself is listed. It's just nothing else about the box. Right, right. I mean, like if you scroll a bit uh, further, uh, you will see this. Uh, Sandbox boxes, source boxes. Um, so, for example, in the source box, you have mentioned the pulp free source and those box, and probably a couple of sentences describing it. So, we could do a similar um, paragraph about the migration box. Yep. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I, I agree. I wrote those sections there just like over the last few months. And I think there is a um, additional configuration that needs to be done on top of that box. And I actually think it's mentioned in the migration plugin docs, uh, right, Tanya? Or I'm not sure anymore. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm not sure either. Okay, we can look into this. That's a good suggestion. Great. Um, anything else on this subject of documentation? Okay. Well, I have a 
uh, I, I really hate the open API spec since it's the main API documentation and it all references pulp href, which I, I, I find incredibly frustrating because it doesn't tell me anything about the structures of the API I actually need to use. And there are some ways to fix that, uh, which I would love to see included. So um, this is in the live, uh, the live API docs? Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. Adrian, I think you actually have a PR open yep. to show a different uh, version of it, right? Yeah, to kind of show the concrete URL. Yep. Uh, and yeah, I would like us to get that merged with just a little bit more documentation for the user so that the user knows that this page exists. I agree. I look forward to that. Yeah, I'll have plus one, just the, the general having good examples in the live REST doc would be very helpful. OK. All right, so I guess. Um, Moving on to the next next section, uh, next section, unless anyone uh, objects. I'd also like the internal API pulp doc, uh, Python docs somewhere, uh, since you do have to use those when you're writing plugins. Uh, Is that you mean the, at some point. the Python <laughs> API? Yeah, like yeah, the, pl the plugin API, basically. Yeah, the plug the plugin. Yeah, so I think actually this got fixed recently, if I remember correctly. Um, we now auto dock the whole plugin API. Okay. okay. Yeah. But That's I agree fine. with you, and if it's not that way, I it needs to be that way. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of a lot of the plugin API is documented or auto documented now plugin api reference yeah this area still needs cleaning up but yeah it, it is yeah there's an issue followed for cleaning this up too or, or adding, de it. adding detail yep yeah that i mean that is super important um yeah. for a developer uh being able to reference the plugin API and have actual clear descriptions of all the classes. I agree. I mean, uh, one of the things this is actually one of the issues that I found that that Jared had mentioned uh, explicitly is, you know, some of these some of these have a lot of detail. Some of them really don't. Um, so uh, here's, you know, some examples of some that that don't really have detail, and then some that, you know, there's a ton of detail. Um, Agreed. All right. Uh, so if anyone comes up with anything else, uh, we can go back to it. Um, but otherwise, um, so there's a section here I where we just want to talk about. Um, so what are some coding tools that uh, core pulp developers use every day that like increase your productivity, um, increase your product, uh, your yeah, productivity, um, and uh, might be useful to other people. Um, so I've I've listed a couple. Um, I'll just do a very very short demo. Um, I don't know if anyone else is aware of the, uh, the tool. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, I know. I was uh, the tool FZF, um, which is Fuzzy Finder. Um, it's it uh, basically uh, it does a fuzzy search of all the files nice. um, recursively. So uh, let's say or you said what director am I in? No, oh, I'm in pop left.
So uh, it's, it's really useful sometimes to find, a, to find a particular file. But what's really useful is it has integrations with a lot of other um, shell commands. So cd so you can cd into you know a view set um, and into any directory uh, with uh, just tab complete there's a special there's a special uh, set of characters they'll they'll send you into FCF integration um, there's one for uh, if you're aware of the control R um, recent command history um, FCF works on this so vagrant and it'll show you like all the recent ones and it does an actual search so like by default it doesn't really give you a good search um, but FCF gives you a really nice search um, so it's super amazingly useful um, there's also uh, integration with the kill um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's got integration for a bunch of things. If you look at the GitHub page, uh, it has a, a, a lot of really nice examples. Um, and there's, uh, some other tools kind of in the same vein. Uh, there's a tool called FD, which is just like find, um, like, like the, the, the shell util find, except, um, it's got colored output. It ignores files in .gitignore um, by default. It ignores um, dot, dot .prefix um, directories, whereas find doesn't um, ignore anything. So like .git, um, it, it, if you use find, it'll search inside .git directories, um, which is not great. Um, whereas find, or whereas FD, sorry, um, will not. I mean, that's cool. Um, uh, there's a tool called rip grep, which is basically the same thing, but for grep. Um, so RG, um, it's got nice formatting, whoops, uh, nice formatting colored, colored output. Um, and it's really fast. And, uh, there's also a tool called NCDU, um, which uh, will show you like graphically how much uh, hard drive space is being used by certain directories, um, which is really useful. And uh, another thing I use pretty frequently is um, I have Visual Studio Code installed. I don't really use it for editing, but every time I get a Git conflict, I, uh, I open VS Code because their tooling for resolving Git conflicts is just so much better than doing it manually. Um, it's really nice. Um, does anyone else want to discuss uh, some of theirs? Uh, I use Git crap a lot. You've shown some great find tools already though. Yeah, I use rag or act uh, for similar things. I also have a finds alias, which is similar to that FD. Basically, you know, find the spread text and ignore the, the wacky stuff. What does git grep do? Just uh, git grep stuff that's in committed to the or the files that are added into the repo. Yeah, so it's basically like um, grep only instead of it works with git. So git space grep, it's a it's a command line built into git itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think it basically ignores everything in Git Ignore too, and shows you even files you didn't check in. Awesome. Um, yeah, 
I'm using a git merge tool sometimes, which is just a wrapper around other tools you can use from. Um, and I, I like Melt, for example, where you have a three-way div. It shows you the version you want to merge, the version that is on master, and the last version they were together. And you can just take this from the left, take this from the right. And yeah, the last thing I added on the list is the git prompt, which is a built-in of the git distribution. That shows you on the command line which branch you're at and whether it's up to date. Any unstaged changes and stuff. Oh, nice. I, I mean, I've got a, a shell prompt that's based on that, but it's, you know, roll your own, so it's missing some of that. Uh, one, one other tool I use a lot often is called TIG, which is Git spelled in reverse. Um, and I learned this from Chris Dury, and it's a um, it's it's like what you get on GitHub, which shows you the network visualization of a Git repo. It shows it shows you the branch and merge points of all the branches um, that lead up to the current checkout um, ref that you're on. So if you want to see like where does stuff come from and how did the merge tree work in the past? And you want to look through a lot of different commits in history. It's a killer tool, TIG, T-I-G. Brian, that's really funny because I use TIG a lot as well, and I use it for the same reason. Eve's the one that uh, turned me on to that one. I mean, I use it for things like, oh, when when was the when did three five happen? And I, you know, I can say TIG in the repo, and then just find that tag immediately. Um, but yeah, it's very useful. Awesome. Um, we got about six minutes left, uh, so I want to run real quickly through some of the rest of this stuff. Um, uh, Mike, would you like to walk through the pull lift section? Yes, I, yeah, sure. So um, uh, first, a bit of uh, good news. Uh, we now have CI for pulp lift. Uh, it actually, uh, even though Travis is hosted on uh, virtual machines on Google Compute Engine. It actually is able to run uh, libvirt with hardware KVM on top of it. There's an unadvertised feature called nested virtualization, and uh, this uh, this is something I'm going to be presenting at PulpCon, uh, not PulpCon, uh, DevConf at US, uh, among other uh, and a broader theme of how to run virtualization and containers on CI and how to do it uh, efficiently. Um, uh, the so this is kind of like duplicate CI with pulp installer CI because the main thing that uh, you know pulp lift does is run uh, uh, pulp the pulp installer against uh, against a virtual machine that's created and managed via Vagrant. Um, however, uh, it does enable us to do pulp. Uh, unlike pulp installer CI, it actually enables us to run full you know Linux distros including their kernels for the special features we need. So we can actually test via uh, the current state of pulp installer and pulp core, the master branches of both uh, with SC Linux and FIPS enabled. Uh, Daniel, I'll provide a link to the pulp installer CI, I guess. I mean, pulp lift CI. Sure. Uh, I'm going to check. I'm getting a tra at the end of Travis link. Um, so I guess while he's doing that, is anyone experiencing uh, disk space issues um, on their Vagrant boxes? So I do on occasion, and occasionally memory as well, depending on how much, how many repos I'm trying to mess with at a time. So I take. I have. A, I have some hand-tuned um, config files for my Vagrant boxes. Yeah, that's what I've done also, is I've increased storage for my boxes. Yeah. Whenever I try to uh, sync content from the CDN using the immediate policy. So is this something you guys are doing pretty often or always? 
No, not always. Um, mostly if there is a bug with the CDN content. <laughs> I mean, I do it always now, now that I have it set up, I just use that box. Um, there's a whole, there's a, there is a class of problem that you can only actually address when you have the actual content on the, on the disk is the one that bites yeah. you. Most, most of my testing, most of my, my coding, I'm working when I'm doing syncing with on demand because it's all about the metadata, not about the actual binary blobs. Uh, but like for all the import export work that David and I have been doing for the last several months, you had to have the binary blobs or you weren't going to be doing an import export. So I used it a lot for that. Okay. Right. Yeah. So currently I think we give that was it the each box like 20 or 30 or 40 gigs of storage. We could make it gigantic, like a hundred gigs and then implement trim AK discard. And what, it, what it'll do is like, whenever you delete a file on the, on the box, the virtual hard disk shrinks. So that isn't uh, something we can uh, we can do now if, if there's enough developer demand. It's just to require implementation, and you know, and your host has to be set up to us that the 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 KVM libvirt hypervisor actually exposes that feature to the VMs. Right. I know there's a lot of. Or thirty two seems to do by default, though. It depends on your on your platform and your even your hard drive to some degree. Um, it, I know uh, that. Well, I don't the know if I make this the default, Mike. Um, but again, this field, this kind of goes back to my thing about, about quick starts and, and wizards and stuff is a, uh, like, a, like a Q and a, Hey, I need more disk space. What should I do? Answer. You have to yeah. edit the file in this way. I need, I need, mm -hmm. you know, I need to have uh, 40 gig of memory because I'm going to about to do something that I know is going to take a lot of memory. Okay. Here's what you have to change. Um, so I don't know if I'd make them the defaults. But making yeah. it easier to figure out than than digging through the YAML and trying to do the right thing would be useful. Yeah, yeah I'll add, add to it an EQ slash advanced use instruction. Cool. Um, right. Uh, is needed so sometimes when you need the when you need the entire blobs, not just metadata on disk for an issue. So Daniel, you want to show that link to the of the CI run? Uh, sure. Uh, so this is the what the public CI looks like, and this is a, a if you look if you look at all the failures and notice they're all on uh, fixed boxes, which basically means that uh, it's it's discovering actual FIPS issues. Awesome. Yep. But yeah, That's SC Linux and FIPS are being tested there via those box or SC Linux can be tested. FIPS is being tested right now. This nice. is great. Hey, there is uh we're at our time. Um, but I yeah. do want to ask the quick question about uh a Docker based box. But we can take that one uh on the mailing list. Yeah. And does that I think there. Uh, I, I've just uh, been looking at some other projects, uh, totally unrelated to Pulp, and uh, uh, there is a trend of providing dev environments that are container based. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Then, just to remind you, we have a slot to discuss various topics on Thursday. You might want to add this one to the list, cool. maybe. Yes. If it's not a long that. discussion. No, it's not a long discussion. I think, mm -hmm. yeah. I will cool. definitely add that to the list. Yep. Um, I wanted to add that um, I don't run out of disk space, but I always adjust all my boxes to have eight gigs of RAM because yeah. four is never enough. So it's like my <laughs> constant adjustment, like always eight gigs. Uh, yeah. Fair. China. I think it's possible for us to do like easier overrides. Um, I think we can do other universal overrides or just like per box overrides without you like always having conflicting Git changes, you know? And this is also something we haven't really documented is how to change these set these box settings. Um, yeah. Of course, like most of us know how to do it, but we should document it because it's something that, you know, a user might want to do. Right. And there's three different ways to do it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> this is the most graceful one.
Well, the other reason to document it is, I don't know about y'all, but I, I can't keep everything in my head and I'll figure out how to do it and I'll do it. And then I won't need to change it or I won't think about it again for six months. And then I have to go through the whole process all over again because I have no idea what I did last time. So having it written down would be useful. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, we are two minutes over. Um, so uh, is there any anything else that should go on the recording? No? OK. Thank you for um, facilitating this discussion. No problem. Thank you. I've learned a whole bunch of new tools today. Yep. All right. See. Uh, could someone? Okay. I can.